I'm kind of a literalist about information. I could have told any number of gross things, but I, I'm avoiding that because I always got in trouble for that. But I was notorious as a psychology professor for over 30 years for giving students way too much information. Now, part of it was as textbooks got shorter and had bigger margins, had fewer references, I kept the content of the class just the same, such that when I had some seniors in a senior seminar, we finished the textbook in the first two thirds of the class, and then I made them each read another book and present it. But it turned out to be a great class that way. Well, the world got its revenge. When I got a telephone call from a friend of mine, a mentor, one of my European recommenders for a lot of things, Fraser Watts, um, and he's president of the Institute or of the International Society for Science and Religion, which is a scholarly organization that you'd be part of only by invitation. I'd never been invited to be a member, although people had told me they'd militated for it. I think part of the reason I wasn't invited to be a member is that the originator of this group, Sir John Polkinghorne, did not like me very much. He was one of my major nemeses. Now I have to be ginger here because I'm sorry, Ginger. We have to be careful here because he just recently died and I had a huge amount of respect for him and he had a huge influence on the whole science and religion dialogue. So, but then you have to respect a nemesis. And over a decade in many public occasions, we had big disagreements and it was exciting in some ways. I'll tell you about one just to, so you can get a picture of it. I was at a theological anthropology seminar at Princeton and that was the one where I uncovered his closet Platonism and the fact that he did not understand that concepts like friendship or the institution of marriage or something like football could be socio-historical constructions and not have some reality in some platonic realm. Now, the funny thing is by the end of that seminar, I was saying things like prefacing almost every comment with, I'm not a theologian, but until the two guys from Heidelberg, theologians from Heidelberg, you can't get much better than that, told me to stop saying that because the theological intuitions I had were spot on. But that's my history with John Polkinghorne. Okay, well, this invitation is tendered in January and I've got till September to do it. It's to present the neuroscientific background of research on embodied cognition. Now, embodied cognition is just the theory that you think with your body, that it's inescapable, and that there's a zillion ways to do it, and the research is just burgeoning, exploding, that, and this obviously has some serious theological implications. I started feeding articles for my student assistant to Xerox, and by about halfway through the semester, she started bringing back not a pile of Xerox copies, but CDs with digital copies because there was so much information. There was way, way too much information. By summertime, I'm panicking. In a family vacation, I ended up spending most of my time at the public library in Columbus, Indiana, reading, pacing, and taking hundreds of pages of notes. Way, way, way too much information. But I finally got it together with a friend of mine who's a philosopher, and there's a philosophy of this stuff too, um, and decided to organize it by answers to philosophical questions, which turned out to be fortuitous because I was going second on the first day of the conference, and the first guy was Alvin Noe, a distinguished professor from CUNY, whose work I knew from a book called Out of Our Heads, Why You're Not Your Brain, and Other Lessons from the Biology of Consciousness. But this was also serious. Not only was I worried about Polkinghorn, but I now have this hot shit dude who's also me presenting right before I am. Okay, so I'm working my ass off. I'm trying really hard to do the best job I can. And it's important. It's important because, well, if you're a Thomistic Catholic, you're fine with this, that God's love has to become manifest bodily in Christ, that bodily resurrection is the only thing that happens. So if those of you that are Platonists and think that there's a soul that leaves your body when you die, you're probably the kind of people that think that bounce leaves a deflated ball when it's deflated and goes somewhere else. But never mind. I had so much information. I had a 40-page manuscript, an 88-slide PowerPoint. 
that I practiced a zillion times so that I could get all the information out, cue the, the, the PowerPoint slides at the right time, and, and get it done. I practiced the night I got to this conference in Germany. I couldn't sleep, so I practiced the morning before I gave it, and I walk into the room. Well, by the way, two weeks before the conference, the organizer, my friend Fraser Watts, said, Alvin Noe is not coming. You have to cover the philosophical stuff too. I get up on stage with my first slide, which is a picture of three motorcycles going around a hairpin in the rain with their motorcycles canted at 45 degrees and their knee pads inches from the road surface. You cannot survive that without your own body being broken up if you're not thinking with your body. But what happened was I realized I was not going to make this through. I was not going to have the audience comprehend me if I went this way. I chucked the manuscript under the podium and just talked to the slides. But since the other presenters later would be Europeans that stood up and read a paper and were boring, I probably had the best presentation of the conference. And in fact, it was Michael Welker, my defender at Princeton, who told me that any of the other papers of the conference could have been missed, but mine couldn't have without missing the whole point of the conference. Well, interesting. I was so high after being told that. It was amazing. And I'm almost done. <laughs> but when I got home after the high dissipated after about two weeks, I realized that seven months of anxiety with a monkey on my back, screwing up a family vacation, it really just wasn't worth it. So five years later, when I retired, I left the world of scholarship completely. That's why you guys get me.